Okay, cool. So, we start by talking a little bit about me. I don't think I, I have to. Does anybody know the movie The Dude, or what was it? Uh, the, the, big the Big Lebowski? Yeah? Cool. So, somebody told me I look similar to this guy, which I don't think I do because I don't have my beard on anymore, but, you know, it's all good. So, if I try to get that lower level, then maybe I will sound a little bit like him, you know. So, anyway, what do I do? Uh, I'm involved in security like probably most of us are. Um, take a look at a lot of different things. Uh, learning curve for me since I've been in security has been pretty, pretty high. One of the things that I do is taking a look at how nation states attack different customers of mine or uh, partners. And in the evolution of doing a lot of re research on what different types of attacks that are out there, you tend to learn quite a few things very quickly especially what you don't know about a lot of things is, uh, when you're working with um, different malware samples, what the heck is Ida Pro, and then you start working with that thing and then a whole new world or universe of um, technology opens up and you find yourself trying to figure out how to get to the next click and then five other trees open up and then you're trying to figure out what the other function does. Interesting. So within the space of that, different uh, folks call us up when they've had some a security assessment done by a big company whose name I won't mention, or companies, they found out that the vulnerability assessments that they did in the penetration test that they did found absolutely nothing because they used Metasploit, uh, which is not really a penetration test, but you know, I think, I guess people differ on what a penetration test is and what it isn't. Um, so after they've done these assessments, oh, lo and behold, someone broke into their systems and then they're trying to figure out what the heck happened. So this is where the real magic starts. Like all of us probably have been through this. You start talking to different people in the attack chain. You figure out what the heck happened. Um, you talk to the ISP, figure out if they have PCAP files so you can analyze the traffic, figure out who did what, when, and where. Um, you find out very quickly that the ISP, although they're required by law, doesn't uh, capture PCAP files. So um, the way of doing research and trying to find these things out is very limited from that regards. You find yourself looking at different things. If you're lucky, you get a piece of code. If you get the code, you um, open it up uh, into IDA Pro Ali Debug, and you start to, to follow the trail and figure out what the heck this thing is doing. And while you're doing all this stuff, a big picture emerges of what's really the end game, what's going on. So I'm going to talk about one of the analysis that we did on one specific attack. And you make your own conclusions. I don't want to be political about who was actually against the attack, but it was pretty interesting. So, just in that regard, some of those things, I'm not gonna explain this to you guys. You, you guys probably know this way better than I do. I'm just a security knob, so I'll just continue with this, right? So, it all started off in a galaxy far, far away, actually in a country that was a little <laughs> far away, right? So we got this call from a few guys that we did a SIEM training with SIEM Security Information Event Monitoring System. Just basically collects logs and tells you if something's going on that's not cool or amiss if you have the correct rules configured and you know what you're looking for, right? So the, these guys called us up and said, hey, uh, idiot, we've got a problem. I'm like, well, well, what do you mean? Yeah, our Active Directory is acting up pretty weird. I'm like, well, well, what do you mean? You're getting GPOs or uh, disappearing or what's going on? Yeah, um, our services are getting knocked down left and right. I'm like, okay. Um, hmm. So it, this was one company. After they contacted us, and the guys know us from a uh, previous training that I did in uh, Ukraine, which, uh, or Kiev, which is in Ukraine, um, the interesting thing was that about two hours after those guys called up, another company called me up. And they told me exactly the same thing. And then about two hours later, another call came in, and they were all from the same industry. So I, got start, I started to think, I mean, if stuff like this happens, there's gotta be a reason for it. Uh, if it's in the same industry, it's got to be something coordinated. So now I need to figure out what the heck is going on, right? The interesting thing was, in hindsight, um, it was October 24th, I believe, the day before local elections for Kiev um, in Ukraine. So I had my suspicions, but <laughs> as all security researchers, we, we teach ourselves not to come to conclusions without doing the proper amount of evidence collection, right? So when we deal with stuff like this, evidence collection gets extremely difficult, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. So the votes happened. Luckily for us, they went through with the different uh, votes, and this guy, Klitschko, I think some of you know them if you're into boxing, or if you're not into boxing, you've probably seen his face all over the place. 
He's the mayor of uh, Kiev, and he made it through the second time. But there were a lot of disruptions that happened during that time frame when these votes were going on. So it started getting uh, me thinking. Yeah, so I'm like, hmm. There's got to be something behind this. There's got to be a different reason for this, right? You know, if it was a simple attack, somebody would break into a system, they'd steal credit cards or some stupid stuff like, you know, um, skinny stuff, data, or try to sell it or do something else. But we didn't find evidence of this. We found a coordinated attack that was um, pretty interesting. We came to conclusions later on, and I'll get to that um, throughout the presentation. And a, a bigger picture started to emerge. So I, uh, we started thinking, this can't be a simple attack. There's got to be more to this than meets the eye. Right? And it was at this point where I started saying, well, there's an actual reality that there could be a nation state uh, behind this attack. And the interesting thing was that they masked this attack in a certain way, shape, or form that you couldn't really detect on first um, analysis who was really behind it. Assumptions, but no real proof. So what happened? Um, there were different things that happened within this attack. One of the most important ones, and this was really an awesome way to do this, I, might, I must say. So lots of temporary files were being created by one specific part of this malware. Um, it was composed of two different things. One of them was a rootkit that hid in drivers. And the drivers were renamed very often. They weren't detected, unfortunately. I wonder why, through antivirus. And this little guy wasn't detected at all went through. Um, I'll get to the details of what was specifically in here. This was just one of the components of a bigger campaign, but it was really awesome. So what this thing did was, it, we assume, was installed previously before the attack. There were timers in the code, and I'll get to that later as well, that waited for a specific command from a CNC server or a bunch of CNC servers. And then they executed their, their uh, payload, which was interesting. And what happened here was, a day before the elections, this virus appeared throughout the entire media industry. So every TV station, every media outlet, every newspaper, they were potentially the attack victims. Um, so far, we found um, like five or six different TV stations and media companies that coordinate all this stuff especially those involved in the elections that were hit by this virus, right? Or malware. It's more than just a virus, it's a lot more complex than that. It's an actual campaign. So this thing started filling up um, the hard drive. First it took a look at, you know, the typical stuff like SID information, user account, what kind of rights do you have, are you local admin, yes or no. The cool thing was, when it found out that you weren't the local admin, this thing slowly started filling up the hard drive with temporary files, a whole bunch of uh, cues. And I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, and it filled up the, uh, the, um, the hard drives on multiple computers that were in some way hooked up to um, media workstations. So anything with video editing, et cetera, et cetera. Very detailed, very complex way of doing preconditions to figure out where my actual target was. Really cool stuff. So it filled this thing up and I'm like, well, wow, okay. It's probably something simple, right? You know, it's just a simple shits and giggles virus that came out, someone did something, they just want to annoy you. But this thing was basically just a decoy. Um, a second part of this malware basically said that you need an admin. So this was just, let's fill up the hard drive so that the admin comes over, logs on. As soon as I get the, the, the admin's account, then I can start doing the magic, right? Um, yeah, and it did. It did. So um, after it detected that an admin was there, it replicated itself using Active Directory, uh, using different LDAP commands, trying to figure out who the interesting folks were, interesting computers where media data was being stored and edited. So that happened on all these different computers. Really interesting piece. But that was only a very small part of it, right? So the actual objective of that pre-stage was just to get an admin to log on to the computer. I think that's cool. I mean. It's not the most complex thing, but, you know, it, it was pretty funny. So the admins, they logged on, and then they got the, the permissions, and they started doing some more stuff. So once we started getting some more information, we, we tried to figure out um, who does malware reverse analysis. <laughs> Anybody? Right? So what are the, some of the first things that we do when we find something that's suspicious, when you execute um, or when you try to find an executable? 
you want to take a look at what the process is and what exactly it's doing, right? So you throw on something like process monitor or something else, you figure out what the hell this thing is doing, which areas it's, it's touching, and what exactly is it trying to do. So this OLOLO.executable, uh, and this had um, names from OLO0 all the way up to like 10 or something. There were different variants of this. And each one of them had specific functions um, that did a few other things as well. So it started writing down the files, but it also did a few other things. Um, it looked at the location of where the computers were, <coughs> and based on the location, it connected to CNC servers that were protected against DDoS attacks. Interesting. Um, and I'll get to that later. So, pretty interesting. It was at this point in time where I thought, this is not something simple. This can't be just the shits and giggles virus or malware. There's got to be some more to this. There's more meat to it. So I did some more um, analysis on the process. Another thing that this thing did, uh, besides being location aware and executing um, up to 133, uh, 137 different variables and calls, it also looked for files. Anything that was movie, anything that was AVI, anything that was in some kind of way, shape, or form related to media, um, it looked on the hard drives, right? So another indicator, hmm, interesting looking for something very specific, a detailed campaign. Right? The interesting thing was that while all this stuff was going on, not one single antivirus solution detected this. Um, it was really interesting too because the antivirus company that these guys work with acted very suspiciously. And I'm not going to name names and you know, if you see it, don't mention it. So um, I talked to the guys because the CERT didn't really help us at all. Um, and we wanted to try to find out how we could get to indicators of compromise, try to figure out what the hell was going on. And that's obviously in Kyrillic, so if you understand Russian or Ukrainian, you'll be able to read that. Right? So uh, don't mention the names. Um, the antivirus company was very uh, weird, the way they reacted to the customer. Um, and by the time all this stuff was said and done, they were pretty much the last people to publish um, a signature to detect this specific strain, right? So, very interesting piece, okay? So, like I said, it was um, a detailed campaign. It targeted an entire industry, which is something that's usually not typical unless you're doing something like uh, bank cards or credit cards or something like that, then I can understand it. But it was a very detailed campaign that targeted some of these folks. So all the different TV uh, channels, all the different media outlets in Ukraine, basically uh, to disrupt anything and anything that they could do that had something to do with the elections. Very interesting piece. So now I thought, okay, well, it's got to be one of the typical guys. There's got to be something that we can do to explain this. So I took a look into some more details of the code to figure out what exactly it was doing. Now, I know you guys know this stuff, but for me it was important. Um, Obviously, there are different things that you can do with PowerShell and LDAP, right? And some of these things are um, pretty interesting. You can take a look at, you know, append data to a text file, you know, take a look for different string values. If you're looking for something very specific, um, different outputs, different um, things that you can do with data, executing different files, etc. And with PowerShell, does anybody work with PowerShell and penetration testing? Someone? Yes? Yes? So you know what things you can do with PowerShell, right? And there were some commands that they used for PowerShell as well. The interesting thing was they were using LDAP to replicate the virus um, to an extent, modifying different things in GPOs, et cetera. So it was pretty interesting. Right? If you want the code, then I can give you that code later when we're done. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, taking a look at these different components, we had LDAP, we had PowerShell, we had some very simple scripts that were all written in C++ um, that basically kicked off um, different functions to fill up the hard drive, wait for the admin to log on after the admin logged on, started executing other things. So the interesting thing was then, once it started executing and got these uh, files, it located the DCs, the domain controllers, um, unfortunately for Windows. Um, so once it started doing that, it infected the domain controllers with a specific um, black energy uh, based rootkit variant. It was actually Black Energy 2 Plus. It was a new variant. Um, and only three of 54 viruses actually detected this one as well. 
So what happened was um, it always used different types of um, file names. If it was an ASUS computer or an Acer computer, it would take the file name for that driver and then replicate itself um, on the DC or somewhere else. So it would try to avoid detection. It would try to avoid people taking a look at what was really going on. It was pretty interesting. On the one DC, we see some of this stuff. So we have um, the other component, which was black energy. Um, we had uh, two different types of um, sys files that were replicated. Then we had uh, some more modifications to the DC. DC2 had a totally different version of that driver, so it was very quickly replicated. And then we also have the OLO executable, which then identified the server app responsible either for media editing, hooked up to cameras, or to the studio or something else. So very detailed campaign looking for specific things. And when you take a look at the code, there's a lot of things that are not only location aware, that expands the functionality of what this thing is doing. It was also specifically looking for uh, these types of files, so it wanted to disrupt it. It was a very detailed campaign to do this. Right? So on the server app, then, it also installed the rootkit. Uh, basically, I don't have to explain dark energy because uh, or black energy. You guys know that that malware, right? So Zbot, et cetera, et cetera. It's a variant of that, so you guys should know that. Anyway, that was the rootkit piece and that was the new executable that expanded this. So they didn't start off exactly with the rootkit itself, which is known. They had a different executable that avoided the detection and started doing the pre-work for the connection to download the rest of the payload. So we analyzed this more, found out, again, there's some research here that it was looking for um, specific media files. That's just that output there on um, IDA Pro taking a look at the different functions and also the processes. Uh, and it was pretty interesting. We found out that it was looking for specific um, applications as well as specific types of files. Um, the next thing about this was, I thought that was it. It was pretty straightforward. Black Kit uh, or Black Energy uh, 2 Plus. We had the second variable, which was OLO executable. It did different features, kicked off a few different commands, did a few things, prepared everything. That was the end of it. The interesting thing was that we started to take a look at the code and we figured out there were location-aware stamps in here. So we wanted to figure out what exactly it was doing. In order for us to do that, we had to infect um, additional computers um, that we could put into a different setting. And lo and behold, once these computers connected um, and appeared to come from the US, the code did something different. So it started to connect to a CNC server that was located in Massachusetts. We took a look at the IPs and the theoretical uh, battery of command and control servers that could um, be used in this specific campaign were approximately 3,000 IPs. Up until now, we're still in the process of reverse engineering this. We have, we've only done about 25, 30% total. Um, I was in the hotel yesterday going through more of the code and I'm still not done. I got about, about 25, 26% done, so there's still a lot we still don't know. But it was interesting, the location awareness of this thing. Um, to me, it looked like it was, um, a campaign that was testing how far it could go, how it could avoid detection, but it was also adding new features to an existing rootkit that is known, right? So it was pretty interesting. Here, um, the servers that we found, and they use encryption, which uh, points to, I think Sandworm was that one specific campaign where they used um, uh, encryption to connect to the command and control service to download uh, additional payload and features. I think it was Sandworm, that campaign. Um, and I believe that was the FSB, right? So at least that's what they're saying. So this connection was there. When we took a look at the IPs, um, just a simple tool, um, IP info dot, I think it was IO or something, right? So took a look at where the servers were, two interesting ones, Akamai and uh, NTT in America. Um, the servers that were there, we started looking, tried to find some more information. Um, they both had DDoS protection, so even if you tried to DDoS the, um, the servers, you couldn't bring them offline, which was pretty interesting. It was a nice, interesting touch. Yeah, it was pretty, I mean, all these things, they started adding up to a picture where you see, okay, it is a detailed campaign. There's something that they, 
this is not the end game. It was just like a start. And I think taking a look at this so far, this was a proof of concept, I believe. They wanted to disrupt um, the elections going on in Ukraine. It appears to be Russia. Uh, it appears to be FSB. It appears to have components from Black Energy 2 Plus. I say 2 Plus because they have new executables that expand um, the existing rootkits that are out there. Um, and there's a lot of features that they can put into this. What we don't know right now is how many additional features will the CNC server uh, download and install on the infected computers. We don't know right now. We can only assume that this is just a pre-staging thing for something even bigger. Right? So, pretty interesting. I don't know if you guys have questions, then, you know, uh, just ask them. So here I'm just going through the IP information, trying to find out which different domains are registered here. And there was a, quite a few of them, like I said, theoretical uh, CNC um, server base of approximately 3,000 IPs based on the segmentation of the network. Could be, could not be. It's very difficult to find. Up until now, we found about 134 IPs that appear to have this functionality. But um, they try to avoid detection, and when you try to scan these things, obviously they're behind firewalls and everything else, which is um, a no-brainer. But you can't DDoS them either. Yeah? How they try to avoid detection? I mean, you are checking more probably for some sort of well, um, strings, maybe, or uh, maybe not, this is like a fingerprint, or maybe. The best way up until now that they tried to avoid detection, mysteriously enough, was um, they actually planted decoys. So um, the servers themselves, they're behind um, firewalls, they're behind a legitimate uh, source like NTT or Akamai. You wouldn't assume this, right? I mean, they're hosting something. Once you try to, to do scans and try to get past the firewalls, it's pretty difficult. So in order for you to do that legally, you have to contact NTT and Akamai and you say, guys, there's suspicious uh, traffic going on. There's an IP originating from your data center. We need more information. Now, I passed on that information to the authorities, but you guys know the same way I do. When you pass stuff on, you never get any information back. I mean, I gave them the code. I gave them the IPs that we had. We didn't get anything back yet. So it's kind of disappointing. But, you know, I can't legally break into um, these servers and figure out what's going on. We just need to assume um, that it's a bigger campaign. And I think it's a POC. It's a proof of concept. What they're going to be working on or what's coming out after that, I don't know. But it does mean a few things. Um, the APT group is still doing their work. Sandworm, that group, although they're supposedly not connected, they appear to have some type of connection. Um, the third thing is uh, they disrupted Ukraine, which is a no-brainer to think it must be Russia. But I'm getting to some more interesting stuff, right? We're trying to find out, you try to identify and prove you know who exactly is behind the attack, and that's a difficult thing, right? The thing that threw me off was when I saw that the servers were in Cambridge, I'm like, okay, this is new, kind of new. It was an interesting one. So we did more and more research, found out that some of the domains were registered under a uh, Crimean uh, group of pro-Russian supporters, and we kept on digging, kept on finding out more information. Um, we found stuff like this, yeah, the typical, you know, pro-Russian uh, Crimea forces that are attacking Ukrainian servers. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I guess I'm crazy because when I see stuff like this, I really get interested, right? Because I'm not a guy that likes taking things for face value. When I see stuff like this, the first question I ask is, really? Can it be this easy? Can it be this simple? It's never that easy. It's never that simple. So... We started doing research on this group, and they still have um, uh, presences. We also found some of the domains. One of the interesting domains was this one, which goes back to that group. I'll get to some more information about that in a minute. So we started taking a look at all these different subdomains, trying to figure out, okay, were they involved in something else? And they were. I mean, this is an attack that happened in August, right? And nationalism or nation state question mark, question mark, question mark that was some of the stuff and when you trace this back Cyber Burke Group was the ones who were supposedly behind this but the reality is unfortunately a little bit more complex than that right? And so in reality when we took a look at these different types of servers, they were only there for a few days and then they were gone right? so if this is a group that wants to do something to be known they're not going to take their servers offline. They're going to do whatever they can to make sure they're in your face, right? 
And I think it was kind of curious that every time I looked for these different types of service, they were there for like about one, two days, and then they were gone. You know? So when I take a look on Facebook and these other areas, they're still there. The interesting thing was that they published um, stuff on Facebook and on Twitter. They closed down fake websites. And you're like, really? So when you think about this, the way um, the Russians attack, you know, the way these different types of groups do their attacks, it fits that picture. And when you take a look at this, you think these guys are behind it, but then when you try to do more analysis on the servers, they're da there for about one, two days, and then the servers are down. Like, well, okay, and that was not just one domain, it was like all the different subdomains related with this group. Now, if I'm a, a fascist group or something else, and I want, I want you guys to know who I am, I'll be there right in your face, right? So, it's really interesting. And the more research we did, the more it didn't add up, right? That was one of the second ones, and hosted in different areas, which is normal. So, Bucharest, there was the other domain that was involved in that, and that was up, it was online for about two, three days during this attack, and then right after the attack, they mysteriously disappeared, right? So, when we did some more analysis on the group to try to find out what, what, what they wanted to gain by this attack or were they really behind it, that's when we started finding these posts up on Twitter and also on uh, Facebook about how this group took down fake websites, right? And that's where we knew, you know, it kind of fits into the picture of, quote unquote, the FSB. We're not sure, we don't have enough evidence to prove it, but a picture is slowly starting to emerge, kind of weird. Interesting. So, some of the, the, the attacks are typical for uh, previous things that we found that are aligned to the FSB. Um, other portions of the attack are similar to things that we've seen in sand, uh, the Sandworm team. But we found similarities also as well with the APT teams that are involved in these different types of nation state sponsored attacks, right? So, the interesting thing was with um, the black energy components that we can map back to specific attacks, they were very similar, but um, there were a few added components into some of the, the samples that we found. So we're assuming right now, based on the evidence that we've collected, that they're continuing their work. They're no, by no means dead. Um, these guys are working. Um, the big question is, is APT and Sandworm and question mark these guys one team or not? And the short answer is based on the evidence. As a researcher, I can't prove it yet, but my assumption is, you're laughing, make sense? No? So, uh, I mean, based on my assumption right now, it looks like it's all the same thing, right? When we did um, the checks for virus total, which is also standard when you find something new, you want to check it out, um, even after, uh, about one, two weeks, the samples still weren't detected by a lot of the antivirus companies in a specific region. I don't know if that means something, but it was kind of interesting, right? Um, the first companies to publish signatures, I think, were the typical ones like uh, McAfee, Semantic, all those different guys. Um, it was interesting that some of the components, it took uh, some of um, the other antivirus companies directed uh, further away from from Western Europe, it took them a very long time to publish the signatures. Now, that might just be something, uh, I may be interpreting something into that, so be careful with that, but it was kind of weird. And one company that originates from the region was the last to publish a signature, which is interesting. I'm not saying anything with that, it's just an observation, right? So, do you guys have any questions so far? Yes, no? Yes, yeah, one. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that um, some of the samples seem to target specific type of machines, meteorite. So did you find those samples in other parts of the world and similar type of machines? Right, so the only ones that we can verify exist right now are the US component um, and the Ukrainian component. Um, from the code that we've reviewed so far, we're by no means done. This, this takes a long time. Um, and I have some pictures of the tree when you expand this thing. This, just the one um, payload itself is interesting enough. Um, dark uh, or black energy basically had components for SCADA. We didn't find the SCADA components in there this time, 
but it's a modular based um, uh, payload system. So they can basically add or detract whatever they want to in this thing, right? All we're saying right now is based on this new type of attack that they're obviously using, using components of uh, black energy, two plus, and they've added additional features to it, right? So the additional features that they added to it, which actually downloads uh, black energy after they connect to um, whatever server it is that needs to deploy this, um, that has avoided detection. So they're constantly working on new stuff. It was interesting, right? But it also means that these groups are still very, very active. I, it's probably a no-brainer, but I'll just say that. And um, even like a, a few days out after the attack happened, this was back in November, we only had a few antivirus companies detecting this to begin with. So uh, we worked with the certs. It took them extremely long time uh, to even start doing research on this. So what was the other guy that was up before me? You know, uh, uh, Aaron. 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 Okay, so what Aaron mentioned about certs, I can only verify it was painful working with them. We wanted to help the guys, we wanted to help the country. Uh, we published all the stuff that we had, by the way, that we did for free. <laughs> we did this on our own private time to help them out. And um, we didn't get any information back from them, no uh, IOC information at all. Um, they basically um, did their own uh, research and analysis and they came to partially wrong conclusions for whatever reason. So when you guys work with certs or with agencies, um, when you uh, have code like this and you do the reverse analysis, don't expect them to come back to you because reality is um, you're on your own, right? So I was hoping that we would get some more information back from these guys. We didn't. So that was kind of painful. But yeah, these are the two different uh, uh, files. So uh, two different versions. And the variants were slightly different as well. And you can see that on the detection. So on the one variant, which was closer to uh, black energy, that was discovered by more um, antivirus solutions. The newer versions that had a few things stripped out, like the SCADA and those fun features, um, those took a little bit longer to discover, right? So they're obviously working on different variants, right? The interesting thing is this attack, exactly the way this attack happened is for the entire industry, right? So we're assuming it's a campaign, we're assuming it's nation state oriented, and the fact that they used a decoy like this Crimea group is also another indicator that it is actually a nation state and we need to assume probably FSB or, you know, Russia or whatever. Um, another piece of the features that we took a look at, um, the service control man uh, manager, there was also um, a wait state that was programmed into the rootkits that waited for a specific date. That date command was sent out that uh, basically then told the service to start. It kicked off additional features, which was interesting. So the... Um, Cool thing about this was is that um, the code that we found, we traced it four months previous to the attack. So um, typically in the past, Black Energy 2 was um, spread out or infected through uh, phishing campaigns uh, and drive-by downloads. The interesting thing was when we did research on finding out how the original infection happened, we couldn't really find that. So, um, Let's think about that for a second. If you can't find an infection vector or prove that that was the way the infection came into the system, then what's the next thing? You need to assume that, okay, well, if this is an even bigger thing, then how did they get the infection in there in the first place, right? Now, if you can't trace it back to a USB stick or something else, which, which is the, the, the basic stuff, you need to assume that this, this was probably an internal um, attack. It came from the inside. But, if that was one company, it would be one thing. But think about six, seven, eight, nine companies. And you can't find evidence that the infection vector was through an email or something else. Now, if you think about that for a second, it's pretty scary, right? So internal uh, infections internally from their own staff, you can't trace it back to an email. You can't trace it back to a USB stick or something else. Unless, of course, the log file was um, deleted and then yeah, there would be a few other things you'd have to look at. So the interesting thing with this was, um, since we couldn't find that, we had to assume it was an inside attack, but then on multiple companies at the same time, right? So the fact that the infection happened four months previous to the election um, also proves, again, it was planted, right? At least in my mind, it does. Any questions so far?
I don't know if I'm rambling, yeah. Uh, you've been uh, mentioning this, that you found similarities between the, this and AFT and Sandy Worm. Right. Do you have any more detail on what those similarities were? Well, um, the, similar, uh, the similarities right now was basically the rootkit was black energy. Okay. That's basically the strain. Um, we didn't find the SCADA-based attacks that they used in, in previous um, uh, campaigns, but we did find evidence through black energy um, and black energy too, and that's why we're assuming right now it's from the same groups. Another reason why we're assuming um, that it could very likely be from them uh, is the nature of the attack and the way they coordinated this. So they had a decoy group that we did research on and found that it wasn't really them. We found out that their websites were on during the attack and um, suddenly they were offline again. When we compared the domain names, we can track them back to previous campaigns that go back to the APT and the Sandworm attacks, right? So domain information, the fact that the malware was similar, um, those are things that we're using to try to piece this together. But if the question is, do we have 100% proof? The answer is no, we don't, right? But that's an assumption. Have you seen anything similar? Okay, because that would then be really interesting. We didn't find any attacks in Germany um, or in Dach yet. We did find attacks to the US and we did find attacks to Ukraine. And again, another similarity. When you take a look at the APT and San Juan campaigns, um, they also targeted US-based resources as well, right? So there are some similarities there again. Could be, could not be, who knows, you know? Security research is always um, a moving target. So you try to find out what you can, try to identify similarities, right? Um, so then the timeline again was, you know, sorry, blue's absolutely bad to post on this. So um, penetration uh, vector remains unknown. It appears to be an insider job throughout this industry, which is really weird. Um, maybe it's wrong, I don't know, but we don't have proof either way. So we need to make a few assumptions. It may be wrong, who knows? It was a multi-stage targeted attack, so we had the decoy in there. We had <coughs> location awareness of the attack, so the attack was different based on the location it detected, connected to different servers uh, to download different payloads. Um, it also reacted differently as well, right? So um, we're assuming it's a remote exploitation um, right now. We don't have enough information to prove it either way, but that's just the indicators that we have. So um, the fact that it was the entire media industry was pretty interesting. Then after that, the, the virus unloaded the additional features, which was the black energy rootkit. So the interesting thing was that the, it was not always the same file. So this thing was dynamic enough to take a look at, for instance, the hardware type and modify the name of the rootkit so that it would be something normal for the, you know, the laptop or the desktop that you had which we found pretty interesting. So if you had an Acer, it took the driver name for the Acer. If you had an Asus, it took the driver name for an Asus, which is pretty interesting. So um, again, uh, when we took a look at these different infected companies, lo and behold, they had different hardware types. And uh, lo and behold, the information that we had thus far, the name of the executables, the, the rootkit, was adapted to these specific companies, which was another interesting thing. Right? Just indicators those assumptions. So, once the, um, the functionality got unloaded, it was waiting for the end game, which was uh, T minus, right? It was waiting for a day before the elections. That command uh, uh, got sent out. They executed, and then they basically tried to disrupt the computers. They tried to identify different types of video files. Um, and then after they found these files, um, it deleted itself and any record of it, right? So it was kind of tough to find this thing out. It took us a few starts to figure out what was going on. So it was pretty interesting. I'm not sure if that was uh, in the APT and Sandworm. I'm not sure if that, that functionality was in there. But I mean, I would think it would be typical. If you want to avoid detection, then you'd obviously erase everything related to the infection. So then the overall uh, executable was delivered, it was loaded into memory, it wrote um, all of another thing. It also changed the, um, the boot records, obviously, I forgot to mention that. Um, and then it also killed uh, basically the laptop, desktop, et cetera, until the administrator logged on. So 
Yeah. And then it replicated itself to Active Directory. Yeah. There were 60 megabyte files. They went to 60 megabytes and then they created new temp files for that. Okay. Then as soon as the admin logged on, it connected, um, the executable kicked off, it connected to a CNC server, downloaded the additional uh, functionality, and did its magic. Right? So, Just another example here, different versions of um, the rootkit hiding in different driver names. Unfortunately, it's not the best of uh, screenshots, but I can give you guys the details later. Um, I have a lot more detail on LinkedIn, so if you guys are following me at all, then I have the reports there in more detail. The pictures are a lot better. I just figured it would be cool to just to, to discuss this so you guys can take a look at the more detailed reports, right? Okay, and then basically the assumption black energy, the features in black energy, we started making the connections, connecting the dots. And then when we take a look in IDA Pro, then the interesting thing was the more you um, figure out what this thing is doing, the more interesting and complex it gets, which is um, not exactly easy. So. I'm fairly new at IDA Pro. I've been only working with this for about two years, and I am really at the beginning stage. Um, who else works with IDA Pro, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How long did it take you guys to understand it? <laughs> what? Two months. two months. Well, well, IDA Pro itself, yes, but I mean reverse engineering, finding out exactly, looking for different things, right? Well, for me it was maybe I'm just a knob. Okay. Some of the other details, some of the um, functions and um, the lines in code that we found, obviously using kernel, using user mode, so there's different components to this. Right? Some of those features, like I said, if you guys want to reverse um, uh, engineer this, I can give you the code, you can check it out. Right? And that's basically it. So I think done for that, done a bit early. Are there any questions? Yes, no. No. Yeah. Was the driver signed? Excuse me? Was the driver signed? That I don't know. I'd have to check. I don't think they were. I don't know. They weren't signed. They weren't signed. No. But there's more details on LinkedIn. So if you need the rest of the information or the reports, it's, it's all there. Right. Okay, cool. Any other questions? No? That's it.